Hello and welcome everyone to another one in our series of Uncle Bobby's virtual author events. I'm so, so, so happy that so many of you have showed up tonight um, and that you're all able to join me in celebrating the release of this fantastic book, One Drop, Shifting the Lens on Race, which was released today. Author Yaba Blay is here with us tonight and she's gonna share about a little bit about this book with us. So please make yourselves comfortable grab a beverage, get cozy. We will begin in just a few minutes after I go over some of the housekeeping rules. As always, our live audience members are invited to submit questions that they'd like answered after the discussion. You can do this by using the ask a question module at the bottom of your screen over the course of the conversation. Um, one drop was released today and you can buy it by clicking the button on below the screen. The green button will take you to our Uncle Bobby's bookshop page. But we also have a very special offer tonight just for you folks who are here live with us now. Anyone who buys a copy of One Drop at this event and submits their receipt will be entered in a drawing to receive a copy with a book plate personally signed by the author to give to a friend or family member. Three winners will be selected and I will be placing the link to that in the side chat bar. Okay, let's get into it. Moderating this evening, we have renowned academic minister and author of many best-selling books, the most recent of which being Long Time Coming, Reckoning with Race in America. He's professor of college at the College of Arts and Science in, in the Divinity School at Vanderbilt University, not to mention PhD from Princeton University. Please welcome Dr. Michael Eric Dyson. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Dyson. Hey, so how are you? Here. It's great to be here. All righty. Now for our featured author. She is a Ghanaian American professor scholar, activist, public speaker, cultural worker, whose scholarship work and practice centers on the lived experiences of black women and girls with a particular focus on identity and body politics and beauty practices. Here to tell us more about her fantastic book, One Drop, Shifting the Lens on Race, released today, is Dr. Yaba Blay. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to make it dramatic, <laughs> a dramatic entrance, <laughs> like us. I think that's Rosa Clemente. I think that's Rosa Clemente said, you, you better be right, Dyson. second device on log out and then log back on <laughs> that's what <laughs> look that's that's what the folk out there saying i can't i can't speak on it dr blay i'm i'm just here to help <clears throat> do you have two devices on all right i think it stopped <laughs> oh, you only have one device on huh Let's see, turn it back on again. Let's see now. What about now? Oh, it's good now. Okay. Of course, of course when you start, it'll start again. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to give that to Mercury retrograde anyway. <laughs> Sheesh. Good evening, y'all. Thank y'all so much for being here. Thank y'all so much for all the love and support today. Uh, it has been amazing, but thank y'all for joining us tonight and helping me to celebrate the re-release of my book, One Drop, 
Shifting the lens on race, Dr. Dyson, it is my honor to be in conversation with you tonight. So thank you for joining me. My honor and privilege, and thank you so much for having me. Of course. So before we get started chatting, because um, I know we both can talk, uh, I want to <laughs> give a very brief introduction to the book. And so I'm going to, hold on one second, share my screen. Can we see that? Mm -hmm. All right. So this book, One Drop Shifting the Lens on Race, focuses on black racial identity and skin color politics. And so I think it's an appropriate conversation for us to have within the context of Black History Month, because many of us take for granted what makes that history black or exactly whose history it is that we're celebrating, right? In many ways, this book represents a conversation about blackness, and considers questions of who's black, who's not, who cares, and why. Rather than to tell you the specific details of the book, because I'm sure you all either have a copy or you're ordering your copy from Uncle Bobby's right now, if you haven't already, I just wanna give you some context so that you can understand why it is and how it is that I came to do this work. Generally speaking, my scholarship work and practice centers on the lived experiences of black people. And when I say black people, capital B, I'm referring to people of African descent all over the world. For me, blackness is a global identity, one that not only reflects race, but one that reflects culture. And within my work surrounding blackness, I focus much of my attention on colorism and skin color politics. Sounds simple, right? Well, flashback to 2010, I was on a panel with this woman. Rosa Clemente, hip hop activist, community organizer, and 2008 Green Party vice presidential candidate. We were on a panel together at the Caribbean Cultural Center in New York City, discussing skin color politics in the diaspora. And for as learned and as well versed as I thought I was in global blackness, I mean, I do have a PhD in black studies, I found myself somehow taken aback distracted even every time she identified as a quote, black Puerto Rican woman from the South Bronx, end quote. I mean, yes, I knew Puerto Ricans were of some African descent, but I certainly didn't know any who claimed it. Where I grew up, there wasn't a large Latinx community and there certainly wasn't many uh, Afro-Latinx folk. You see, I grew up black as I am in New Orleans, Louisiana, and there you were either black, white, or Creole. And in my experience, folks who had the privilege of identifying as Creole did. And as far as I was concerned, they were just saying that they were Creole, so they didn't have to say that they were Black. Mm. In my experience, many Creoles rejected Blackness. In my experience, many Creoles rejected me. I remember not being invited to the birthday party of one of my very best friends in elementary school because she said, her mama said, I was too Black. I also remember not being invited to the wedding of an adult colleague for the very same reason. So far, as far as I was concerned, Creoles didn't want to be black and didn't have to be. And so anytime I encountered one or anyone who even looked like one, I already knew who they were or who they weren't. Or so I thought. But meeting Rosa, I started questioning a lot. I started rethinking what I thought I knew not only about folks who looked a particular way, but about blackness in general. And so I embarked on this project and wanted to investigate what I was then calling the other side of blackness. I interviewed over 70 people representing 25 different countries and countries of origin, ranging in age from 21 to 103 years old. 58 of them are included in the book. So the book not only features short narratives, which I wrote based upon my interviews, but it also includes a portrait of each of the contributors. Shout out to Noelle Teard, who I worked with on this project. She was the director of photography and she created most of these portraits herself. Now, while the contributors all use a variety of terms to self-identify, they all see themselves as part 
of the larger racial and cultural group generally referred to as Black folks. All of them have had the experience of having their identity called into question based upon how they look. And most of them have been asked, what are you? Or the more politically correct, where are you from? Time and time again. So when we met, the very first question that I asked each of them is how do you identify racially and or culturally? Black Puerto Rican, Black from Louisiana, Black Latina, Black and or mixed race, mixed and or Black. Black of mixed heritage, Afro-Cuban and or Black, African-American, Black, African, mixed and or Jamaican, Black, Black American Muslim, Black, Ethiopian and German. Now, part of the purpose of this book is to examine how it is that we as black people come to identify and define ourselves. Historically, this picture represents what it has meant to be black by law. In the history of the United States, a black person has been referred to or defined as any person with any known black African ancestry. Although this definition has been referred to as the one black ancestor rule, the traceable amount rule, and the rule of hypo descent, it is more popularly known as the one drop rule, meaning that one single solitary drop of African blood is enough to render a person black. Said differently, the one drop rule holds that a person with any trace of Black African ancestry, however small or invisible, cannot be considered white. They must be considered Black. So again, they cannot be considered white. So essentially, in the history of race, in the history of this one drop rule, all of these codifications were created ultimately to protect whiteness. Whiteness was defined as pure. So looking at this chart, we're talking about one, two, three, five generations back, one person, five generations back is enough to make you black according to this law. Now you should know that no other ethnic group is defined or counted according to the one drop rule. You should also know that the one drop rule is characteristically American, meaning that in no other nation or society does this rule have any applicability or even make any sense for that matter. In fact, in many places, for a person of African descent, any one drop of anything else is enough to render that person something else. In the introduction of the book, I map out the history of how it is that the United States came to adopt such a specific and seemingly quantitative definition of Black identity. And it was impor important for me to provide that historical context first because I want us to think critically about how it is that we as black people come to identify and define ourselves. Many of us have accepted the one <laughs> as our own, but the truth is we didn't create it. Because of this, many other people reject the one drop rule and resent definitions of blackness that don't originate with black people. So once we come to know and understand this particular history of race, my question is, does that necessarily mean that we should reject it altogether? And if the answer is yes, my next question is, how then might we quantify Blackness as a group identity? How then might we qualify Blackness as a group identity? Who would be Black and why? Or rather, who would be Black and how? A large part of what I'm attempting to do with this project is to get us to reimagine Blackness, if you will. It is absolutely not my goal to tell people how they should identify or to tell people who they are. 
It is my goal, however, that we understand the politics behind our own identities and that we understand the politics of blackness. Amen. Let the church say amen. Uh, it's such an honor to be here with you, uh, Professor Yaba Blay. And you've you've got right to it. So I want to engage you in conversation so that you know you're able to expand upon these brilliant ideas. Because when we hear these notions of social construction of race, right? right you know, do we have a construction company somewhere, you know, digging into the ground of uh, biology to produce the building and architecture of race, right? In terms of reimagining it, right. uh, is Kamala Harris black? No, she ain't black. Yes, yeah, she black. Her daddy from Jamaica, but he's disappeared. Her mother is Indian. How do we talk about that? Is Obama black? Is it meaning, uh, does blackness mean uh, the kind of assault upon whiteness, the impurity of blackness. Think about anthropologically Mary Douglas, purity and danger, the danger of blackness. And you're you're giving us brilliantly and charting it literally uh, the historic Eurocentric definition right. of what blackness is as a smudge, a biological smudge, a mark against whiteness. And you are then asking us to reimagine you know, the biologically redetermined conception of blackness, because it's broader, always has been, than a particular epiderma, epidermis fetish about what the skin color might be. Walter White, the head of the NAACP, looked like a white man, presented as a white man. Um, what does it mean to have these varieties? And here we, you know, looking at the screen here, the infinitely brilliant chocolate charming, wonderfully <laughs> glorious, uh, Ghanaian American thinker and theorist, Yaba Blay and the yellow Negro, Michael Eric Dyson. <laughs> I'm the token yellow Negro on the panel, but what does that mean? What does that mean in terms of, if we talk about white privilege, can we talk about light privilege? What is the refusal to acknowledge the privileges associated with a particular color in the same way that white folk resist acknowledging white privilege. Because white privilege don't mean every white person rich. It don't mean every white person got bank. It don't mean every white person going to Rutgers or Harvard. It means that the people who go to Rutgers or Harvard are white, usually. And it means the people who are rich are white. It doesn't mean all of them are. It means the tendency that those who will constitute that particular population will be that way. Mm -hmm. So light skin privilege doesn't mean, oh, all light skin people think X, Y, and Z. It means, however, the objective uh bequeathing to that particular skin shade and tone a kind of privilege whether you ask for it or not that's mm -hmm. already there mm -hmm. like right almost white mm -hmm. mm -hmm. or, or in this case adam clayton Powell. so mm -hmm. you've raised so many powerful questions and so i want to start by asking you or asking you <laughs> 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 when you said it ain't my it ain't my role to tell you you know, how to be black and what is black, I want you to think about the politics behind it. Why is it that in 2021, we are still obsessed with the constitutive characteristics, mm -hmm. to be redundant, of blackness? And what does it mean in a culture where white supremacy has been on the rise again? Is there a correlation between the presence of white supremacy throughout history, but especially now, and the focus and obsession again on racial identity. Absolutely, thank you for that, Dr. Dyson. You know, it made me think of one of my favorite quotes by Dr. Neely Fuller. Mm -hmm. If you do not understand white supremacy, what it is and what it does, everything else you think you understand will only confuse you. Mm. So in this moment, heightened white supremacy continuously. It's interesting to me that we spend so much time talking about diversity and equity and inclusion. Belonging. Mm -hmm. There's so many folks who now want to be anti-racist. Right. What happens is in their attempt to focus on anti-racism, they tend to focus on the other. We are the other. The lens looks outward, right? Let's learn more about black people. Let's more, learn more about people of color but it doesn't say let's learn more about ourselves. Mm. White is the problem. 
We mm -hmm. are the problem. And so again, if you don't understand how white supremacy functions, all of this is, is useless. So yes, we are still talking about race. We're still trying to understand. And for me, I'm saying, let us understand blackness for ourselves as part of that path towards empowerment and, to and as part of that path towards change, because we have to spend time understanding white supremacy. We can't be fooled into believing that we can just all, all hold hands and get along and all this is going to go. If this is not a we are the world situation. But right. what ends up happening, we lose focus and we decide, well, it's time for us to just all get along. And nobody is checking whiteness. And so for me, on the one hand, I did this work for us because I thought it was important for us to understand how we're moving through the world and how we're relating to one another. Because one thing that I heard a lot from many of the contributors was a, a feeling of rejection from other browner skinned black folks or to have other browner skinned black folks say, you're not black, you're this, you're that. Other folks telling them who they are and them trying to make sense and make peace with who they are. It is a necessary conversation that we have to continue to have. But also, I'm also interested in how white folks receive this work. Right, right. right. Because as, as you sit somewhere in a space of power and privilege and determine that you're going to be anti-racist and the checklist says, I got to hire three black people, which black people are you going to hire? Mm. So, so Dr. Dyson, if I may, you and, you and I both, professors, right? Mm -hmm. Both focusing on black studies. Right. Prestigious white institution wants to hire a professor of black studies. Which one of us might they hire? It could go both ways. They might want the person who screens blackness. So they're going to hire the blackest one of both of us, mm -hmm. or they might want to hire the one that makes them feel comfortable in their whiteness. Mm. So, that be <laughs> that might be easier, right? And so for, I need white people to understand mm. the diversity and the politics behind blackness because this anti-racism work has to be go, go beyond you just getting a simple check and a right. gold star to say you hired someone black. Jesse Williams is black, Idris Elba is black. Both fine, both beautiful black men. Mm. But both have different relationships to whiteness within this structure. Who are you more comfortable with? Right. No, that's a, yeah. based upon appearances. And so we can't dismiss appearances. Skin right. color politics is absolutely part and parcel of racial politics. But while we're on that, <laughs> we have you here, because, you know, I do think of you as one of the blackest folks in America, and I'm sure <laughs> many other folks do, given the work that you've done. Right. Here's the setup, y'all. Here's the setup. Here's the setup. Here's the, setup. And the, and the work that you've done the setup right here. on our behalf, howsoever, sir. I, I can't even ask you the second question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm jumping in. All right, all right, you jump in. But look, while you're doing that, let me ask you one question before you, you know, then get in my grip, so to speak. I'm going to get in your grip, yes. Look, look. So Idris Elba and Jesse Williams, light-skinned, black people, right? Light-skinned, black man, uh -huh. yellow black man. Yes. Darcy and black man, both beautiful, both uh, radiant and charming and delicious to so many people, right? Correct. And so brilliant. But tell me if I'm wrong, dark-skinned black men have had a purchase and a kind of sexualization that has worked to their advantage Absolutely. in a way that dark-skinned black women have not enjoyed. Right, dark-skinned black women, Judy Pace, like when I was growing up. All right, I mean, we were all in love with you know Pam Greer, brown-skinned okay. black woman, Lord Jesus. So the thing is, is yeah. that dark-skinned black women have not been constructed mm -hmm. because of our predilection for tall, mm -hmm. dark, and handsome. Even the description of a white man is tall, dark, and handsome. Mm -hmm. When you have a Denzel. And yeah. you have a, a, a Wesley Snipes. Mm -hmm. So that in that way, I'm not suggesting they don't have any kind of restrictions or impediments or obstacles or the historic legacy of white supremacy echoing across the, 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 the whisper of time, so to speak. But having said that, the construction of the sexual profligacy and prowess of a black man yeah. satisfying unconsciously the yeah. dominant culture's yeah. ideal of black masculinity and That's sexual really. prowess means that they get constructed in a way that the black woman who's rendered as oversexual yes and demonized yes. for the very thing that the black man whose darker skin 
has been celebrated for. Can you help us understand that? And then you can go and jump on, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. So what you're speaking to, I, I talk about this a lot in my work on colorism. What you're speaking to is the feminization of whiteness mm. and the masculinization of blackness. So if we take it back literally to a moment where black bodies were on the auction block, that our value was absolutely assessed based upon how we looked. And the darker you were, the assumption was you fresh off the boat. Mm -hmm. You're from Africa. You're more animal-like because, again, we're talking about binary opposites throughout this conversation. White versus Black, European versus African, civilized versus barbaric. And right. so we are enslaving people. We need them to work like animals, right? Mm -hmm. So you start looking at the Constitution and all of this historical language. Black people weren't even regarded as human right? based upon our proximity to Africa. That's so. Right. Dark skinned men, we are looking at your bodies black as you are. Yes, we can look at you now and say that you're fine, but historically, that meant that you were going to be a good workhorse. Right, right, right. Right? That's what it, it aligned with your masculinity, works for you. But dark skinned women, however, if we feminize whiteness, if we look at socially constructed uh, standards of beauty, absolutely predicated on white supremacy, right? Because what it means to be a lady is to be refined. So think of all of the kind of like Victorian images of queens and princesses and duchesses, and, and they're sitting, interesting, I'm, I'm gonna jump in here, I'm gonna try not to talk too much, but my, no, work, no. My, my work on skin bleaching, the history of skin bleaching starts in Europe. We're talking about Queen Elizabeth who used to take arsenic wafers to poison herself gently each day so that she could have a ghostly look. We're talking about women, the history of makeup is literal, literal white paint. It's literal mm. white uh, powder. Queen mm. used to draw blue veins on her forehead so that she could give the, 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 the look of translucency. That's how white she wanted to be. So whiteness was feminine. It meant you got to set pretty somewhere and not work outside in the sun. Mm. Right? Mm. So whiteness meant that, meant that you were refined and in the house. Right. Darkness meant that you were out somewhere working more like an animal. So for women, the lighter you are, the more beautiful you are regarded, the more the, the proximity to whiteness means there's a proximity to refinement. This is why we get Viola Davis cast as the mammy in The Help. Mm. So again, when we start talking about white, white media creatives, you might get a check because you got a black actor or actress, but mm -hmm. which one do you want to hire for which role? Would that right. role have worked had she been Jack A. Harry? Mm -hmm. or another lighter, no, right? right? Because the idea is, again, taking it back to historical moment, if you don't have a woman in the house no, close to your man who has a history of raping such women, do you want one that you think he might be attracted to? Mm -hmm. Right. Mammies right. tend to be darker, tend to be browner. Dark-skinned women are, are, are left out of a conversation of beauty. So again, the dark skin works for brothers. It doesn't work for sisters. Similarly, or I should say relatedly, think about the brothers who have been mishandled and, and, and murdered by the police. What does their blackness communicate? Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. what is it that you see when you see their black bodies, and what is it that you you see and, and think that you need to exert a particular level of force? We are still in a frame where we are thinking that dark skin is an attachment to less humanity, mm. and so it absolutely operates according to gender line. Right, right. And in your case, because you know I'm about to come back to you, I'm not. Gonna <laughs> Since we're talking about you, and I know you know it's no surprise you you are light skinned yes. Um, <laughs> but, for, but for light skinned brothers, y'all get to be pretty boys, yes. The Albie Shores and the Elder Barges, but it's the same feminine. The, the Drakes, the Drakes, the Drakes. It's the same Pepper. femininity, mm. right? Mm -hmm. You feel less masculine, right? Because of the light skin. Right, right, absolutely. You differently, right? But what I was going to ask you, because it's interesting, you know, given the work that you do and your commitment and passion for Black folks, I'm curious in the same way that I'm curious about folks in the book. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about how folks see you, like how you've been received and if your Blackness has ever been questioned. <laughs> Oh, no question. See, this is how skilled uh, Professor Blay is. It's her book signing. It's her book. 
<laughs> she turning the lens right on me. I mean, that's why, think, that's why she wrote the book, and I'm just here trying to talk about it. <laughs> uh, let me let me answer that briefly and poignantly. I've written about this, right? I've talked about it in many of my books. I remember a, a woman came up to me. She said, "Oh, you're lighter in person than you look on TV, right?" As a compliment, a black woman. Oh wow! In Florida, right? Oh wow! In other words. Now that I see you in person as a lighter skinned black man, I can associate a level of aesthetic attraction or appeal or the belief that you're rooted in a historic legacy of, you know, lighter, brighter, whiter, and therefore more visibly alluring, right? Yeah. Paper bag test, New Orleans, where are you from, yeah. right? That the paper bag test, whether it's Howard or <laughs> New Orleans on the, on the post, and if you're darker than that, step back. Right. So there's no question. I write about it in regard to my father, who was who was blue black, right? right. I don't know if y'all know about blue black. Yeah. I'm talking about show enough, darker than dark, right? And my father was treated in a manifestly different fashion than I was, right? I was treated even differently, and I've written about this and talked about it. Interestingly enough, with um, on on Black in America on CNN with Soledad O'Brien. And I got pushed back from some people saying, because I said, my brother, my late brother, God bless him, Everett Dyson Bay, darker skin, browner skin, black man. I suggested that one of the reasons he was sitting in prison in the pen, and I was a professor at that point at the University of Pennsylvania, one of the reasons had to do with the differential treatment accorded to us, the earlier recognition of my gifts as a light skinned did highly intelligent, yeah. prodigiously intellectual black boy versus my brother equally talented who may not have shown as visibly his own skill, but they didn't dig deep enough or were curious enough about events, about, you know, uh, if you will, bringing it forward, putting the right conditions under which he could flourish. Yeah. So I got an advantage for that for sure when I saw my father's mistreatment not only by white folk, by the way, by black people. So you're animalistic, yeah. you're darker and dangerous. And yeah. he was called muscles, he's a very muscular man. So there is no question that on the negative side, there was the demonized, stigmatized association of darkness with him as an animal. And at, at the same time, a kind of brutal um, envy for what he represented. And then yes, being challenged, right? Remember, uh, I don't know if it was Kobe Bryant was telling somebody, stop acting light skin. <laughs> Be a man, right? <laughs> Act like you got some skills, right? Yeah. Steph Curry, light skin ball player, mm -hmm. not as masculine, right? We we're constructed, right? Not as not as constructed historically along those legacies and lines of what it means to be a real man. So yeah, I, there's no question that I've experienced the extraordinary benefits, privileges, and advantages mm -hmm. that accrue to lighter skin mm -hmm. and the talent. Mm -hmm. the challenge comes just initially when they step to me and then after I speak, they back. So, but you know, right. in fairness, thankfully we are talking about skin color politics and colorism, right? right? What often happens when folks see this book, what I want to be clear about is that skin color, colorism are real. Right. Black racial identity, however, is its own pointed conversation. So my question to Apart you- Apart from, right, right. okay. It was, has your blackness been questioned? Has anyone questioned whether you were black enough or asked you if you were mixed or is you <laughs> white or where are you from? Oh, yeah. I mean, and I'll tell you how. So it's interesting, you know, some of the stuff on social media, some of the some of the white people who can't stand what I'm saying, he's probably look at it. He's probably mixed anyway. He's probably got white ancestors. He's trying to deny. That's why he's overcompensating mm. for being a black man. Um you know, I've been challenged in the way that most black people, I suppose, have been challenged in terms of whether or not we are adhering to a principle or a practice or an ideal or a goal that you're a sellout, you're a time, you're not being black in that way. Mm -hmm. I, I haven't, fortunately, maybe, uh, been challenged so much in term because I have been so publicly identified with a characteristic uh, expression of blackness, a no-holds-barred blackness, right. an unmitigated blackness, right. uh, an unquestioning adherence to that blackness, that that's, that hasn't necessarily been the case. Now, it could be. Then somebody told me, but look at you like you yellow Negroes, Farrakhan, 
Malcolm X, Adam Clayton Powell. Are y'all overcompensating? Uh, you know, uh, that could be the case, right? But I was reared in an all-Black community in Detroit that taught me the value, yeah. the beauty, the beauty and the virtue. So I'm from the hood and the deep. Yeah. So sure. there ain't no question about what that represented. So fortunately, so far, you know, 62 years, I ain't had much question about the character and nature of that blackness. But I'm sure there's no question that some have tried to step to that in a certain way and okay. got brushed back pr okay. pretty quickly. Yeah. Okay. So nobody ever mistaken you for like Latinx or from another. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, and that's, uh, yeah, of course. You know, it depending, uh, uh, you know, when I had my black hat on, they said, Are you an Orthodox Jew? <laughs> right? Seriously, right? Or they speak Spanish to me and I was like, oh, <laughs> no, no, I ain't, I ain't fluent in that. So there's no question in that sense, yeah. thinking identity, and if you mean blackness in that way that somebody's yeah. assumed I'm something else, there's yeah. no question about that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's interesting that you brought up Orthodox Jew. Again, when we talk about whiteness, you know, and it's something that I mentioned in the book as well, even the ways that we understand whiteness now, it's like we're not able to pay attention to the ways that whiteness remains in power enough to determine mm -hmm. who gets to enter that category, right? Because mm -hmm. Jews weren't always white. Jews weren't always considered white. In fact, Black, Sephardic Jew, right? Mm -hmm. Black History Month fact for you, the straightening comb, the hot comb was not invented by Black people. Mm -hmm. It was invented by a Jewish man because they are as invested in a performance of their identity, right? As invested in being received as white, that if their hair got a little kink, a little curl, a little twist, a little thicker than average white hair. Jufro, Jufro, right? Is that what they're right? Straight, and we're going to relax similar to black folks, right? Mm -hmm. Italians weren't always seen as white because they have a darker complexion as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, in this moment, in fact, crazily enough, folks from North Africa, are regarded white. Algerians and so on. Mm-hmm. Right. Physically from the continent of Africa. Right. Al but, come you is Algerian, like, right? Right? No. No. Yeah. But see, you're raising a very powerful point. I know we're going to go because we got so many smart people out here who want to raise questions yeah. to the great Dr. Blay. But, but talk to us then about, you know, what's at stake? Because we're not going to resolve it. But what's at stake? with even evoking the question of blackness and the pain and heartbreak. I think about Sister Tarika with the, with the super glue on her hair. Oh, wow. And you gorilla. Know, people, hmm? Gorilla Glue, Gorilla Glue, I'm sorry. And then clowning her. And then the owner of Gorilla Glue had to say it's made for this and it's permanent and so on and so forth. Then you got a black surgeon stepping in. Talk to us about the pathology of the pursuit, hmm. but also the demonization of the result. Cool. So that people, you know, on social media, the harshness cool. and the viciousness cool. of going after this young black woman, as opposed to trying to understand the world in which she existed that might have tempted her mm -hmm. to believe. And, and does it take that much? It's the European ideals of beauty, of hair, of what is acceptable. Help us understand that issue about the Gorilla Glue and what it says about blackness in America and what it says about who can be black and what... The, the performance of that blackness in a certain way. You know, if you had to ask me that question 15 years ago or so when I was a grad student at Temple University, where we referred to each other as Europeans and Africans and the home of Afrocentricity, I might have come for that sister and said that that was a reflection of, of some self-rejection or dare I say self-hate. In this moment, I hesitate to project any meaning onto whatever it is that she did or experienced outside of using something that was not intended for hair. I've seen all kinds of conversations and, and positioning what she did within the realm of self-hate and what sisters do to our hair. That's such a broader conversation that I don't think points specifically to the gorilla glue situation. I think it will point more to us wanting to understand why she wants to wear her hair straight why she wants to have her hair laid down to a particular way. There are ways that we could think about it, but admittedly, I feel like I've, I've grown up in such a way that I need my work on blackness to connect me to more black people than mm -hmm. distance me from black people. And I feel like so many of us, when we approach our work on blackness, we do it with a level of harshness and visceral that it doesn't reflect the love 
for black people, if that makes sense. Like we're so busy to call people out. We're so mm. to to you know, and, and you know, Twitter is my least favorite social media platform, primarily because people are just. I've had people try to tell me what I know and what I don't know. You right. know. And, and I'm not going to get online and argue with you and have mm -hmm. to invest any credentials. But I'm saying all this to say, I know that this work has helped me to grow, particularly because I had to put myself in a position to listen, as opposed to entering a room and saying, I'm a professor of black studies. This is what I know. And no, you're not black. This is what you are. No, let me be quiet. And you tell me who you are and how you are. Because interestingly enough, black as I am, I've never had to define or defend my black. I've never been put in a position to have to formulate a response to what are you? You know what right. I am. Right, you know right. Me. But people who are constantly questioned, they are coming up with language. They are having to sit with and sift through their feelings and their family histories to come up with an identity. What if we were to flip that on those of us who are browner? If we had to define our blackness, how would we define it? So mm. for when I think about blackness, I want to think about my blackness in a way that connects me with more people in the world. Because what white supremacy does is it has us sitting in this limited space, referring to ourselves as minorities. Mm. When there are right. more of us in this world than there are of them. But we two thirds world. We're the two thirds world, not the third world, right? The two thirds world. All right. We sitting here, thirteen percent of the population, actually believing that we're minorities. Yeah. And then as an adult, I go to Brazil and I'm blown away by the fact that the large majority of people look like me. Salvador de Bahia. Yeah. That's not the yeah. Brazil that's on my TV, though. Well, of course not. You know, you got Rio and so on. But see, that's an extremely important point um, in terms of how we define blackness. Then we'll get to the uh, to the audience. Um, it is extremely important. Right. Is Daniel Cameron black? Is, is, is Clarence Thomas black? What kind of black? That's what I'm saying. That's my point, though. And, and, and you raise an interesting point that as a lighter skinned black person, you might more readily have your identity challenge. Right. In other words, your bona fides. You, you, how you you know, so I got to show you I got my I got my black card waiting right here. Let me yeah. tell you. And I got and I got the five things. <laughs> gonna shut you up. Right. <laughs> Boom. But black, darker skinned black people may not be right? Challenged in the same way. And as a result of that, you know, are we looking at phenotype versus genotype? Are we actually looking at skin? And we're, are we looking at flesh? Because we know that race is, as a social construction, so much more complicated and deeper than that. So in talking about a Daniel Cameron <laughs> or a Clarence Thomas, and when people say, well, he ain't black, well, he still could be black and still jacked up. He could be as black as you can be, and, and want to be and still wrong, morally and politically, socially wrong. But just not our people. He not our people, right? So you can be black, check the box, we see what you look like. That's built upon a white supremacist understanding of race. We've created a box, you fit it. When we go to the cookout and we holding off on our, our invitations, when right. we cook out by ourselves, are we going to let him in? Right. Let's right. have a conversation. Well, he did this. He did this. He didn't do this. No, he can't come neither. Mm -hmm. And I think for our own love for ourselves and our safety mm -hmm. and protection, I think we have to have, this is what I'm saying. Like, I don't think we can afford to be out here coming for each other's necks, right? In a particular way, when we haven't firmed up who we are as a community, a global community, what are the standards that we're setting for our community? What are the, what are the standards that we want to live by? Mm -hmm. as people it can't just be enough it we have to move beyond these 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 boxes right, That's, right. Race, race is one reality it is not the only reality that we experience right the oppositional binaries uh the this or that and as you introduced and we'll go now to the audience questions but as you introduced him puerto rican mm -hmm. you know afro-cuban mix mixed race and then you know we got we got deep arguments about African descended, you know, the ADOS movement. Right? Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to do that. We're not doing that today. <laughs> you're a Canadian American, right? So wait a minute. You're a Canadian American, so you don't have the legitimacy to articulate uh, or adjudicate between competing claims about what blackness is because you, as a Canadian American, are part of a privileged class. When you ask the question, right? When you ask the question about 
who is the school letting in? They ain't just letting in light-skinned Negroes like me. 50% of elite institutions of higher education, the black students who are admitted, either African or Caribbean descended, right? That's a whole nother ball of wax For in sure. terms of constituting legitimate blackness. Absolutely. You know, that I, I see is on the screen over here as I, yeah. but I'm transfixed by your transcendent rhetoric. <laughs> so it <laughs> deprives me of the ability to peace it's every day. Good. It's all good. No, but that's a, that's a, Again, these are conversations like I wish there was a way for us to close the doors and us to have this meeting that we've been needing to have <laughs> generations. But these right. are the conversations that we need to have for ourselves because, right. you know, you know, again, being raised by two Ghanaian parents, my father, also a retired professor, he came to the United States to do his Ph.D. Mm. at Wisconsin, right? His first job was chair of his department at Xavier University. First job. Mm. Right. And so there is absolutely a privileging that comes with coming from somewhere else based upon how white people see it. And this is what I keep wanting us to come back to, y'all. Exoticized we, blackness. We're doing it based upon white folks' ideations mm. of us. What are our ideations of us? Right. So even if I'm talking to my folks from diaspora, I got to check folks on how they then see folks who are of American descent. Because again, what we're doing is internalizing that which white folks have projected. We didn't create this. this right. Is you're saying we have to look at white supremacy. We're not the problem. Ah, we could talk to her. I know y'all out there going, that darn Professor <laughs> Yaba Blake. She is blazing. <laughs> right, I know she is. I know she is. All right, so we're going to have Sister Evita come back on uh -oh. right in time to ask. Hi, everyone. Question. So I did something crazy um, and wound up uh, logging myself out, but um, I got it back on the cell phone. Okay. So <laughs> we're ready to field some questions. We have quite a lot of activity from this audience. I knew there would be. Number one, this is from Shaggy Flores. That's a great name. That's right. It wasn't me. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> during your work, especially in interviewing folks who identified as Afro-Latino, did they speak on dealing with other Afro-Latinos when questioned their blackness based on their phenotype? Meaning your subjects didn't fit the stereotype or their, mel um, or their melanin was not black enough. How did they deal with the phenotype police group? There's a growing Afro-Latino movement even being pushed by scholars that argues blackness based on skin color or the color of the skin of the parents. Absolutely, great question. It's interesting when I reflect on what has changed in the past ten years since the original book came out. This is definitely a conversation that I'm I'm interested in engaging and learning more from folks who are browner skin Afro Latinx, folks who might regard themselves as gatekeepers in a particular way, because that is absolutely something that I see much more of now: a policing of who gets to identify as Afro. And so, because I'm not. Latinx myself, I want to take an opportunity to learn and not speak for them. But for the folks who are in the book, many of them, interestingly enough, would tell me how they identify, but would hesitate to identify out loud, if that means that. recognizing that that might cause some tension or cause some beef and also not wanting to fight. But then there are others like Rosa, like Rosa got time. She'll fight you, right? And so I think they're are ways that folks are trying to make peace or make sense of their identities for themselves and recognizing that, yes, okay, I may not look like this, but like, I know who my people are. And I also know what I'm about. Also recognizing this whiteness and this blackness also um, finds itself within the diaspora, right? So this is why we have to put Afro in front of Latinx because just to say Latino, when I, when I lived in Miami um, as, a, as a graduate student, all of the Cubans there were white, mostly, right? But again, when we think about the politics of that movement, they were the ones who fled the revolution. They were the ones who could afford to flee the revolution, right? It doesn't mean that's what Cubans look like, but if you don't know that, if you don't think critically, then you might think that's what Cubans look like. I have to say that I know that there are a lot of personal politics involved um, within the Afro-Latinx um, identity. So I know that I didn't clearly answer your question, but I wanted to say that it is something I'm interested in understanding more myself from the perspective of folks who are browner skin, 
Afro Latinx. I want to understand what it is that they're gatekeeping and why it is that they feel the need to keep folks who are lighter out of the identity. Thank you, Shaggy Flores, for that wonderful question. Um, let's see. Uh, there are a few questions here that I think are all centered around the same the same subject, and that's um, well, this is from Duana. What now in 2021 do we teach and instill in our children about blackness? And then another question that um, asked something similar. Um, sorry, where was that? Um, from Melinda and, and Sekou Laidlo. Um, what do, has your work, um, academic and cultural work, taught you about how best Black folks can feel from our own anti-Blackness? Yeah, I mean, so to Dewana's point, you know, of course to the babies, and I'm speaking as a parent and now a grandparent, nobody teaches us how to parent, right? Oftentimes we, for better or for worse, we do what was um, repeated or what was done to us. And so we learn trial by error, but just from this side of things and looking at a lot of particularly black girls, right? Cause that tends to be my focus. I think it's important for us to teach not only our children, but ourselves. We have to focus on the joy and the pride that comes with blackness. I think so much of our understanding of blackness is rooted in history in particular histories. And in that way, we walk away only thinking of ourselves again as victims, as being oppressed, as minorities. And again, it's important that we be seated in that history, but also when we look at, it's why I love historical fiction. It's why I lo love looking back at certain images of history. Even through all of that, we still found space for joy. We were still believers. We, we believe in God. We pray. We dance. We smile. We like, can we also focus on that? Because I believe that saved us. I believe it kept us alive through generations. And so here we are now. We may be feeling a particular type of way. And still, we find time for joy. We still believe, right? We still move forward. And so I don't know how to translate that directly to children, but I think it's somehow important for us to make sure that our children take a particular sense of pride in their blackness and that we show them all the things that make them uh, beautiful beings culturally, that make us beautiful beings culturally um, as well. What was the second part of the question? The second question? Um, that was, excuse me, um, just, what has your work taught you about um, about how black folks black folks can best heal from our own anti-blackness? Yeah, um, for me, and again, every we all going to know our entry point. Maybe because I'm somebody who's I'm just a questioner. I have lots of questions all the time. I like to ask questions and I like to talk <laughs> uh, more than I like to read. Quite honestly, but in those conversations for me, the learning has been the healing for me. Like once I started learning about particular history, because again, this is the thing, when we don't think critically, we take everything that's given to us K through 12 and even in college as fact, right? When we don't look outside of that to find our own truths, we take that as fact. These are very limited and again, politically chosen histories that we right? Politically chosen, um, fields of study that we're given access to. That's not exhaustive. So for me, when I was able to move outside of that and just start asking my own questions, I started coming up with my own answers. So like in grad school, my dissertation focused on skin bleaching because I believe my aunt, my mother's sister, she died at an early age because she spent most of her life bleaching her skin. Mm. I, I wanted to understand what light skin symbolized in Ghana. I wanted to understand, you know, and again, when we talk about the beefing that we do, I know so many folks, men especially, let me tell my truth. Men will jump in and be like, oh, she hates herself, right? Oh, sis, you just need to love yourself. No, brother, you need to love me, right? Because on the one hand, you're going to tell a dark-skinned woman or a black woman that you shouldn't relax your hair, you shouldn't wear a weave, you shouldn't bleach, you shouldn't do all these things, but who are you, who are you checking for? What she look like? Because ultimately the things that we do are ultimately about being received and accepted and, and being loved, right? But we have the audacity to somehow 
check people. And so for me, as much as people are like, oh my God, I can't believe they bleached their skin. That's just so, that's just so sad. No, why is bleaching an option? Why are there companies who make billions of dollars off of creating bleaching products? Why aren't we looking at them? You want to look at the people who are doing the thing as opposed to the person that made the thing an option. But for me, the thinking critically, that's been healing for me. Because again, I keep coming back to, we did not do this to ourselves. We are not the problem. So for me, focusing on white supremacy heals me very much. Let's me know that it's not me. I'm okay. But there is an institution historically that has been created to oppress me and I reject that. So all that to say, I think everybody figuring out for a lot of people, um, spirituality, right? Um, uh, uh, embracing our, our African traditions culturally, right? Traveling the world to see our people all over the world. Different people heal in different ways. But I think as a general kind of reflection, I think the more that we um, embrace our blackness, the more that we, we see ourselves in our blackness, our global blackness, I think there's a lot of healing and knowing again that you might be only 13% of the population in this country, but we are everywhere. And everywhere we are, there are things that connect us. You know, so when I look at little girls, little school girls in New Orleans with their hair bows, like there's a whole culture around hair bows in New Orleans. And then I see little girls in Haiti with their hair bows. And then I know the history that the large majority of Africans coming to New Orleans were coming from that region. We are, we brought our culture everywhere we've gone. You can't kill us. You can't kill us. You might kill our bodies, but you can't take our culture from us. That's something I'm proud of. Like white supremacy tries its best to kill us. It won't win. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we have some time for a few more questions. Um, this one is a two-parter. Um, let me see. This is from Makiba. Thanks all for your words and energy. I have two questions. Number one, how does a Rachel Dolezal or La Bamba uh, deter these kinds of conversations? And what are the very real concerns of white imposters on how racially ambiguous black votes participate in black culture? And number two, I'll uh, come back to it when when you're ready, um, is Dr. Blay, you keep asking, um, how do we, as, a, as Black folks, define Blackness? And, and in the spirit of self-determination, how do the both of you define Blackness? Uh, what does it mean to be Black to you? So, you know, people have asked me a couple of times, what do I think about Rachel Dolezal? And for the most part, I just answer that I don't, right? Like, I don't even want to give her any energy. I saw that she was on a show maybe last week, week before last in Black History Month talking about how she hasn't been able to get a job in the last six years and, you know, all of her woes. And I feel like we've given her too much energy. But again, in terms of asking questions, and I'm going to ask you, Dr. Dyson, so you can jump in here with me. <laughs> what do you think about Rachel Dolezal? It's, it's interesting. I was on the podcast with Mark on coffee and, and books the other week, and he asked me a similar question. And I, I don't know how I feel about Rachel Dolezal. You know, I feel like, again, we just give her too much attention. She, But at the same time, she could have ended up in my book. Right? I wasn't doing no DNA test. <laughs> I wasn't looking for birth certificates and such. She could have been in the book if she said she was black. But when I when I look at the little that I have seen about her, that's that's the picture of overcompensating that you spoke about earlier, Dr. Dyson, right? This notion that she she took on a very performative blackness that I thought was problematic, right? Like you taking pictures of your, your sweet potato pies and talking about cooking greens and wearing kente cloth head wraps. Like she had a very limited ideation of what blackness was and was performing that for acceptance. But the question is for why? Now she's walking around talking about she's transracial. I don't know if I have the skill set to even address that. What do you think, Dr. Dyson? Rachel Dolezal. I'm 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 concerned with Yaba Blay and her work, and it's brilliant and it's powerful and it's poignant. You know, Jess Lombera, La Bamba, what's her name? Jess La Bambara, right? Um, you know, the most recent example. Oh, 
Krug or something like Jessica, that. Jessica, Jessica Krug. That's yeah. the one, you know. I think they were asking about her as well. Yeah, yeah. And which is a more complicated situation, because she's writing. Some said brilliantly about the black diaspora in her book and felt the need to perform it as a black Latina, black 10X, right? Um, in the culture, articulating her beliefs, her principles. When people read her book, they were going like, yeah, the book is dope. So now the question is, who gets a chance to write about, think about, and then slide into that, that niche of blackness? You know, it reminds me of the late uh, great novelist, Leon Forrest, who used to tell a story that white people would go because they saw blackness. They, they heard us. They dogged us. They, they stepped on us. They made us, uh, you know, smell the feces and urine on the Middle Passage mm -hmm. where, you know, 12.4 million people brought uh, to North America. 1.8 million died on that passage. But he said, no matter what they did to us, if I could just be black for a day, because they knew the value and the virtue and the power of it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I, all I say is I'm sitting here listening to Dr. Yaba Blay uh, putting it down that, yeah, I, I want to be there, too. <laughs> <laughs> but these are kind of the questions. And again, I did not keep up with her story at all, mm -hmm. at all to know the details. Right. So the well, question the I have is. Why did why did she do it? What was it right. that she was seeking to gain in so doing? You know, was right, she right. with a brother? Was did she have black a black man? Like I, I'm being serious. I don't know why she did it. So my question for all of us will be like, what is she doing it for? So on the one hand, again, it's I think it's just it's tricky because I understand the gatekeeping, right? But at the same time, again, at this private conversation for us, it's right. like it's how I think about. Our response to the Kardashians, for example, right? Right. I started the project Professional Black Girl because I'm like, yo, we don't have to wait for white people to steal it to claim it, right? Uh. Right. That right. How, we claim it every single day. Why don't we celebrate it every single day? Because my experience, having taught it in HBCU, which will go nameless, I found my colleagues training our black girls away from themselves, right? That this idea that for you to go out into the world, you had to be professional. You had to wear your hair in a particular way. You had to dress in a particular way. You had to code switch and speak in a particular way. And so that you had to leave your blackness behind to gain some success in the larger world, which I get to some degree. So long as we recognize it's a switch that we turn on and off. And for a lot of people, they don't know how to turn the switch on and off. And so there's a, the anti-blackness is part of that. I think that's the type of anti-blackness and that's a performance that becomes part of who they are. What about your blackness? So again, on the one hand, you might walk through the world doing this code switching, whether you realize it or not, you're acknowledging blackness as a problem. But then when the Kardashians come and perform it, you mad. Mm. You don't want to do it and they're doing it. So do you own it? Again, just, Questions. Right, right, right. Just questions. Um, <laughs> to the question of how do you define blackness? How do you define your blackness, Dr. Dyson? You black? Uh, no doubt about it. No. no. Are you black? Do you use black or African American? What's, what's the language you use? I use black. Okay. Right. I eat, well, never mind. No, I, use, I mean, there, there, there are a variety of simplicities <laughs> of neologisms that I define. <laughs> But the thing is, is that because I did grow up in the hood in Detroit, so we know what that is. So, uh, and even that, the absorption of an epithet and then draining it. And you can argue about it, what it means, how it signifies. But there's no question that for me, you know, blackness is uh, historically constituted, uh, communally based, spiritually affirmed identity that is practiced and performed in the best sense of that word. Yes. Time and again. See, yeah. I don't want to give up. You know, I know, you know, performativity and I know the contemporary generation talks about performativity, but I'm saying John Lewis was performing. Martin Luther King Jr. performing. Right. King understood that this white bigot down in Alabama needs to be put on front street. So let's just send some children and and black men and women. Uh, and then he's going to wash them out with the water hoses. There is performance in the very basis of who we are. So there's a negativity associated with performativity, yeah. mere performance of identity. I ain't talking about that. I'm Thank talking you. about the rich 
resourceful theater of black being that resonates in every poor, in every country, a uh, uh, culture, in every city uh, with which I associate. So for me, that's what blackness is uh, time and time again. And it's a reaffirmed quality of being, just like being converted. When you become a Christian or whatever you become, you don't just do it one day. You just affirm it day in a, and, and you fight over it and you struggle for it, right? Not for the sense of self-conscious affiliation with it, but for defining and redefining. Like tonight, you're you're making many of us, hmm, let's think about that. Let me reassess what blackness is. Let me rejigger, you know, and refool with the puzzle to figure the thing out. But at the end of the day, ain't no question about it. That's what blackness is to me. Right. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Um Talking about that, that the nuance, I think, uh, between our understandings of performance. A lot of times when folks say performative, it's all, it comes across as like, oh, that person's being fake or it's right. bad. Thing. But I think you're absolutely right that Blackness is a performance in a lot of ways. Like we, mm -hmm. we put our culture on display very richly and very actively and very mm -hmm. loudly. And so for me, when I think about Blackness, again, it goes beyond what the paper says. It goes mm -hmm. on this historical definition of you don't define me, right? So if I put that aside, when I look to see who am I like and who are my people, that's absolutely predicated on culture. Mm -hmm. What we do and how we do it. And I don't care where you're from. There are always connecting points to how, the kinds of food we eat, how mm -hmm. we eat them. You know, growing up in New Orleans felt like growing up in, a, in, a, in an island of its own because the culture is so rich. And then knowing that that culture is impacted by so many different places allows me to feel at home. It is such a beautiful experience. For those of y'all who haven't had the opportunity to travel throughout the black world, even if you just go to one place, don't stay on the resort, go see how the people do. Mm. Or go eat some food off the roadside. Go you know, make friends with your taxi driver. Go see how people are living and recognize how you might find yourself at home. I feel at home in so many places. To me, that's my blackness, which is why black with a capital B is not to be confused or completed, completed with American. And I think a lot of people do that. When I think of folks in the diaspora, I know they're like, I'm not black, I'm Jamaican. Or I'm not black, I'm Nigerian. No, you're black. <laughs> We're also this particular, you know, um, cultural identity, but blackness is such a larger, you know, umbrella that that all of us fall under, I think. But for me, it's very much connected to culture, our spiritual beliefs, you know. Um, yeah, it, it's culture for sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for those great questions. Um, and thank you both for this wonderful discussion. It really, it just is giving me life. And I know, I know all of you out there uh, in the comments, y'all were giving us so much love in the comments. So thank you very much. Thank y'all so much for being here. Thank you for all your love and support. I love all of you. Make sure you buy your book. <laughs> yep, you can, you can click the green button That's on black the, too. the screen. <laughs> black, black, black right now. <laughs> You can also come to Uncle Bobby's Co Coffee and Books in Germantown, Philadelphia, if you're if you're around. You can get Thanks. your copy there. For sure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Dr. Yabla Blay. Thank you, Dr. M Michael Eric Dyson. I'm just this, this was such a such a wonderful wonderful discussion, and congratulations on on your re-release. Thank you. Mm. We're gonna spread this far and wide. Bye, y'all. Everyone have a good evening and be safe. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.